Hello, welcome. I'm John Fain and Beth Wilson, who I've been a friend with and colleague from time to time over many, many decades, has asked me to talk to her about her new book, The Lost Lovelies Foundation, which I'm very pleased to be able to do. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders and also express my personal impatience for a treaty or treaties without which this country is a bit stuck in the past, long overdue. So, without any further ado, let's say congratulations and hello to Beth Wilson. Hello and thank you. The Lost Lovelies Foundation, I don't want to spoil the, the, the tension and the excitement for those people <laughs> who are going to grab your book and consume it for all of its many different themes. So how much do you want to give away before we get into the discussion about the issues that the book explores? Um, I'd rather talk about the themes in the book, I think, than what actually happens. And some of the characters, I think, are essential too because they're yeah. richly drawn. Yeah. So here we are with uh, a tragedy. Do we tell people about the tragedy that the book starts with, Beth? Given that the book starts with it, I don't think it's a spoiler to, no. to tell them. Go right ahead. Okay. So um, our heroine, for want of a better description, <laughs> Anita, has a baby which is much wanted, much loved. Um, they're at the hospital or the birthing centre. Um, the nurse pops out for a moment. Um, the husband pops out for a coffee. When they come back in, baby's gone. Missing. Missing. Disappeared. Gone. In fact, I read that first chapter to my accountant, who is also a fellow harmonica player, and I read the first chapter. He said, what happened to the baby? I said, no, no, you have to buy the book. You've got to read it. No, 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 you can't leave me like this. What happened to that baby? So I had to find another section of the book to read to him so he didn't go away all unresolved. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, having established that our lead character is um, beset by tragedy early on, we also, I don't think, are spoiling anything by explaining where the title comes from and the link between the disappeared baby and the Lost Lovelies Foundation. Yeah. Well, the baby is indeed lost, having been taken by another birthing mother um, whose baby was stillborn. So after um, Anita manages to recover from, or well, if she ever does recover from her grief, she sets up a foundation um, in memory of the child and she lobbies hard for victims' rights, particularly where the crime has been against the child. And she becomes, um, and we see a number of these characters in our society, in our community, in our economy, people who then devote themselves to a cause that's, that's in a way changed the course of their life. Now, why have you chosen to dramatise, if I can put it that way, and to, to expand on the, the lived experience of people who then go through this extraordinary challenge in their lives? Well, that in itself um, is an answer to your own question. It's fascinating when you see people who are so driven, who are so not able to move on. I was listening to Radio National not long ago. A terrible thing to do. Yeah, it's shocking. I should have been on 774, but um, <laughs> I was listening to Radio National. As long as it wasn't 3AW, that's okay. <laughs> I sometimes appear on 3AW oh. with Dr Sally Coburn, as you know. And she's a wonderful person. And she's great. Um, so um, I was listening to Radio National and I was listening to the father of one of the victims of the plane that went down over the Ukraine. Oh, yes. And he was an extraordinarily forgiving man and it really struck me. And, um, and he said, I've got children. You have to move on when you've got children because their needs are immediate. And, and he came across as an incredibly forgiving, sensible, balanced person. So I wanted to explore what happens to people when they don't have that balance in their life, when they've got so much grief and so much justification in their own minds that, that they, they become everything to themselves. Is it a noble cause? Depends which side you're on. Um, I don't want in any way to denigrate foundations as such. I'm on the board of a foundation, I'm patron of the Satellite Foundation. They do fantastic work. 
However, hardly a month goes by that we don't pick up the paper, if we still pick up papers, I do, and read that some foundation's gone wrong, somebody's been tickling the till. And when that happens, benevolent people who like to give money to foundations and charities, they think, well, where's the money going? And, and they, don't, they close their wallets. And we don't want that to happen because um, foundations do some great work. Well, we saw this, in fact, there's no better example than the New South Wales branch of the RSL in recent years. Yes. Right, right, one could go through a whole lot. Even um, There was even a yoga thing mm. scandal not so long ago. Frankly, I never did trust yoga, but anyway, that's a personal <laughs> thing. Don't worry, there's still plenty of time. <laughs> so we've got this foundation that she devotes herself to. You've touched on the fact that sometimes they do fabulous work and sometimes they go off the rails. I don't think we're giving too much away to say that there are some rollicking roller coaster tales concerning the internal affairs of this foundation. And I emerge from reading the book, Beth, with a fairly clear view that you think that the oversight of these charities and foundations is woefully inadequate. Why do you think that? What's led you to that conclusion? Well, the newspaper reports of so many scandals. But there's so many where there's no problem. Yes, of course there is, and they're the ones that we want to protect. Um, and we do have a charities ombudsman now. Um, that's a new thing. But there are literally thousands and thousands of charities, foundations that crop up all over the place some of them named after their founders. Um, I've always said to my husband, if I die, please never have let anyone describe me as bubbly and don't ever have a foundation named after me. Because? In, in some ways it's the height of vanity. But you're not there to enjoy it. Yes, I know, but it shouldn't be about the individual. It should be about the cause. And, and charity in itself is always a problematic thing. You know, you go back to the 17th century and uh, William Blake is writing his songs of innocence about little kids lined up two by two or cleaned up dressed to go and receive charitable alms from the faithful. And these kids are poor as church mice. Um, you need people to be in a terrible situation to give charity to them. Mm. I'd rather look at a society that was more equitable. Yeah, I think the formal definition of charity is the alleviation of poverty, distress and suffering, which has been from time to time interpreted when challenged as, well, pretty much doling out soup. Yeah. If you're doing a lot more than that, and almost all charities now do, they've expanded their, their ambit now into lobbying and sometimes as you touch on law reform and so on, they see prevention as much a part of their, of their jurisdiction as the actual treatment of the problem that they're trying to address. Yeah. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Instead of just being at the bottom of the cliff, picking up the bodies as they fall down, you may as well go and find out why they're falling off up the top. Yeah. It reminds me, when you and I were on a certain tribunal many years ago, Bill Hayden came to address us and he had been the founder, I think, of this particular tribunal. Do you want to name it rather it than social... leaving it as a mystery? People will be thinking, Sorry. what are they talking about? Yeah. It, was, it was Social Services. Social tri... Security Appeals Tribunal. That's it. Which, the which SSAT. We heard appeals from people who felt that the Department of Social Security, as Centrelink used to be called, had made the wrong decision about an invalid pension or an overpayment of the dole or whatever it might be, and they would come to wise souls like Beth Wilson yeah, in and order to, Fain. In order to have their claim independently heard. Yeah, it was a multidisciplinary um, tribunal, same model as was proposed during the National Socialist regime in Germany to get rid of um, disabled people um, in the interests of the state. But back to the story and the yes. reason for it, Bill Hayden came and addressed us members of the tribunal and he said, it's wonderful to see that you are so successful because you have quadrupled in size and you have far more work than you had at the beginning. Well, that to me is a demonstration of an absolute failure. The way that you would prove the success of the tribunal 
or a charity is to eliminate the problem in the first place when there was no longer any need for the appeal. Yeah, but the, the charities these days, I mean, there is a bottomless pit of need. Oh, yeah. So it's hardly surprising that a successful charity, and how you define success is a, a whole conversation in itself, a successful charity can continue to grow as it explores that bottomless pit of need, whether we're talking about, I don't know, literacy, whether we're talking about aspects of public health, or I know you're involved with the Continents Foundation. I mean, there's, yep. the, the, there's no limit to what you can achieve. No, no, the need is definitely there, but I just wanted to have that little moment of utopia, please, John. <laughs> Well, in these times, I guess we can't deny it of you, but I'm not sure how realistic it no, is. No, it's so not realistic. Back to but it's, not, it's realistic as a goal. Yeah. But it probably can never be attained. No. So back to regulation of charities. We've seen some shocking examples of abuse of power. Yes. And fraud. And it comes down, does it not, to regulation. It comes down to oversight and independence, checks and balances, like so many other things, whether we're talking banks or aged care or charities. Yep, scrutiny, regulation. Um, it also comes down to um, greedy people recognising that when human beings have dollars floating around freely and people are giving cash out as donations, it's, it's wide open for abuse. Now, there's many other aspects to the book and I'm going to come to them in a moment, but still just drawing on, pulling on this thread of charities and the like. Um, your character in Nita very quickly becomes enamoured with the, the social scene, yes. which, which, which many charities draw on for funds. And there's, there's a phrase I've never particularly liked, but it, it's, it's hard to go past it, which is ladies who do lunch, who yeah. very often turn these events into a fundraiser for a, a worthy cause. And much good work is done, but at the same time, it, it's it's sometimes viewed, and I think I'm probably bordering on the cynical with this here. It's it's viewed as a bit of a gesture. Is that how you see that that whole syndrome? But your character gets very much seduced by this. Well, the thing about Anita is she comes to believe in her own dream, as it were, and she loves the microphone. She adores the audience, loves the spotlight, the limelight. So. And because she feels justified because of the great loss that she suffered, she sees no problem with that. She's not able to examine herself. She's sucked in by the media creature that she becomes. And there's any number of examples of people who are the exact opposite. Your character is the opposite of Rosie Batty, for instance. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. A Rosie worked absolutely tirelessly to help with domestic violence and still does. And I've been on a committee with Rosie. I've got enormous respect for her. Um, this is when good things go off the rails and it is definitely fiction. Is it a result of the, the, the trauma, the distress, the grief of the initial event? Does, is that what sometimes shakes people's moral compass? I think so. I think if you can't look grief, grief in the eye, then you can never learn to live with it. I once asked our dear friend Louis Waller if the pain the ever... The former, former professor of law at Monash Law School, dean of law, a great... Um, and, and the creator of the IVF legislation, the, the framework. And a great there. orator. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He told me once that he and his wife had lost a child about 17 months, if I remember, or it might have been 17 weeks. I'd apologise if I've got that wrong. And I said to him, does the pain ever go away? And Louis thought carefully about it. He was a great careful thinker, you will remember. And he said to me, no, it never goes away, but it gets less jagged with time. But you've got to learn to face it and understand its role in order to get to that stage. I don't think my character ever does. Why doesn't she? Because she perceives a great wrong, the wrong to lose a child, especially a newborn baby. And your firstborn. Must be absolutely horrendous. And that's, I mean, she does move on. She does some fantastic things, but she never loses that feeling of vindication. And so she's out for blood. 
Now, your storyteller for much of the book, who ends up as her assistant, if we like, at the Lost Lovelies Foundation, starts off, though, in a very different role. So tell us what that is. Well, Martha is a midwife um, and she absolutely loves her job. She um, becomes Anita's Girl Friday. Are we allowed to use that expression? Executive well? assistant. Oh, executive assistant, yes, indeed. <laughs> Um, and and does her bidding the whole time. And at first, she's thoroughly enamoured of Anita, particularly because she bears some of the blame for the loss of the child because she left her patient. She was the midwife in attendance at the birth. And and then she left She she left the side of the baby momentarily during which this terrible baby theft took place. Mm. And in law, I mean, it used to be that the surgeon was the captain of the ship and they took the blame for everything. But in more recent times, we've seen liability for negligence um, being found against nursing staff in exactly that situation where a nurse has left the room to attend to another patient. Something happens in their absence, a fall perhaps, um, and the court has held them to be responsible. So that's the situation that Martha is in. Except she's between a rock and a hard place. You can't, you can't be by the side of a patient or a newborn baby 24-7. You've got other yeah. obligations and systems of work and personal needs and whatever else it might be. I mean, there's an element of luck, bad luck in what happens sometimes too. Yeah. Depends who you talk to. I was lecturing a, um, undergraduate students at a university once and I put the facts of the case where the nurse left the patient who then had a fall and I asked the students, what did they think about the judgment? And they thought it was grossly unfair. They thought- On the, who? On the nurse. Mm-hmm. The nurse wasn't backed up. There were not enough resources. But the, there are several of their teachers in the room and they took the absolute opposite view. And they thought that the ca- court case was absolutely correct, that there was negligence. Are we too quick to find fault in people? That's not a perfect world. Um, fault is problematic in law, of course. Um, New Zealand for a long, long time has had a no-fault insurance system, one that I've always favoured and one that was recommended in Australia in the 1970s mm-hmm. by, I believe, Sir Edward Woodward. Mm-hmm. But we've never uh, actually managed to get it. What we have is a patchwork of Medicare, traffic accidents. Work, so workers' compensation. W- workers' comp. But it's not all one thing like in New Zealand. So yeah. um, it's it's the luck of the draw whether you fall over and injure yourself before you get out the front gate or not as to what the rest of your life's going to be like, whether you get compensation to meet your medical needs or whether you get nothing. Although the NDIS was originally designed to take away all of those anomalies. For people with disability, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it was in its first iteration, it was going to be a universal compensation scheme and it was deemed to be unaffordable. Yes. Got gradually whittled down and whittled down. As as happens always. Yeah. Mind you, it's a good scheme. I've got a family member who who loves being part of the NDIS and is able to purchase the services that she wants, not what other people think she wants. So let's go back to your character. Yep. Who dutifully and loyally serves the woman who she feels in part responsible to and for her grief. And she goes through an extraordinary transformation. We've touched on Anita, but we should also touch on the transformation of Martha and the the fact that people's lives aren't static, that they they move, they yeah. change over time. Well, Martha carries a great burden of guilt. And every time she hears Anita talking about her grief, subconsciously, that is um, accelerated. Um, that's the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Exacerbated. Oh, dear, and I want to call myself a writer. Can't even think of words. Um, and But she suddenly sees the side, or she doesn't suddenly, she gradually begins to see the side of the victim and that victims aren't, sorry, sorry that perpetrators, the, the, sorry, sorry, not, yes, perpetrator. She yeah. sees the side of... Of the woman who took the baby. Yes. Mm-hmm. A- and begins to understand her point of view. And, and that's quite a transformation. And how her. does that come about? Again, I'm, 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 it's up to you how much you want to give away and tease people with during this interview. 
in order to to interest them in the themes of the book, and there are many more. We're just getting to them now. So um, do you want to just touch briefly on how she ends up going through that rethinking? It, 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 there's a number of things that cause Martha to reflect and change her position. One is a nasty call from a troll who just happens to be hitting the nail on the head. She has um, conversations with her walking group who see things a bit differently. Um, in, in, in pursuit of her cause, Anita has put up a bill before the parliament, which will mean that nobody who's ever offended against a child will be released from custody without the permission of the bereaved parent. Which is a kind of victim's rights... Gone mad. Extension, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and... You might say that, well, that kind of law would never pass, but there's been some pretty draconian stuff and, and COVID has taught us just how far we can go with legislation when um, the cause calls for it. But um, Martha has cause for reflection and gradually becomes comes to realise that she's been caught up in all of this blaze of glory and adoration combined with terrible guilt uh, until she can begin to see the other side of the story um, and reflect on her view. It's a bit late in some ways and, and she's never completely resolved. Um, but it's a journey that, that I was hoping to take the reader on. It's Martha's journey yeah. and it then becomes other people's journey as well and we won't go too far down that path. But um, it's not an unusual one, is it? No, I guess not. And um, it was a journey that I went on too because... In um, what way? Well, I thought I was writing about Anita initially and I wanted to have Martha as an observer and a narrator but playing a second role. Um, but she kind of took over the stage herself. Is that because you identified more with her as the... Um, self-effacing, loyal, hardworking, sincere part of the partnership as opposed to the self-aggrandising, attention-seeking, self-promoting Anita. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and um, Martha needed to grow as well because uh, she would have been quite boring if she stayed loyal and all of those things that you just described. So there's a bit of Beth Wilson in Martha. There's a bit of Martha in everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but a bit of you in her as well. Yeah. I mean, your personal transformation was nothing to do with what we're discussing at all, but at the same time, I mean, I've known you for, I don't know, 30 or more years, and in recent times you've been the Health Complaints Commissioner, you've been a public speaker, you've done all these extraordinary things, but when I first met you, you were a librarian. I was a librarian. I was a librarian at the um, Law Reform Commission and the Law Foundation. And, but I did have a law degree. But it was a very kind of background role. Um, and over the 30 years I've known Beth Wilson, you've gone from being someone looking after the leather-bound volumes of the Law Reform Commission's library to being a public performer and a public figure and an office holder of great, some great responsibility in, in an extraordinary transformation. I suppose so. Um, I'd, the librarian's role was a really, really interesting one. I, I got some extraordinary calls from people. I was really more of a, a, re a researcher than the librarian, I think. But I remember getting a call one day from uh, several calls, actually, from the ABC. What do you know about suppression orders, <laughs> Beth? And I, I told them. And, and then this chap came in, curly, curly, curly black hair, Wearing, was it a pink or a green elephant earring? Thanks. Thanks, Beth. It was luminescent green. Luminescent green earring. Hello, Beth, he said. What do you know about suppression orders? And I threw up my hand and said, why is everyone asking me this morning about suppression orders? And John said, who? This is me that you're yeah, talking John about. John yeah. said, who? Who else is asking? I said, no, 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 no. I'm not telling you that until you tell me what's going on. And, of course... John and several of his colleagues were applicants for the role of broadcaster of what was then called the Law Show. I the think. Law Report. 
Was it always the law the report? The law report on Radio National. So Tom Malombi, who'd been you've outed me. Oh, Tom. Tom yeah. Malombi, who'd been presenting the law report, was leaving to go to the bar in New South Wales, That's where right. he went on to become a very respected QC. Um, the ABC had advertised the position, and as part of your application, you had to research, write, and perform a three-minute monologue. And the topic chosen was suppression orders. That's right. So I said to John, let's go and wake up the library's greatest resource, <laughs> Sir John Norris, retired Supreme Court judge. Um, he was called Bugsy Norris in those days. You wouldn't be allowed to do that now. Um, so we shook Sir John awake. Now you have to describe he's slumped in one of the leather chairs. Yes. He comes in every day for a sh before he goes off to the club for a sherry and lunch. Yeah. And reads the newspapers and checks the latest Supreme Court reports. Yeah, and he's in and his pinstripe suit with a suit with a soup stained tie. Oh, poor Sir John! <laughs> sticking out ears, terrible teeth, and sort that's of why they called him Bugsy. Crumpled and in his in his eighties by then, I suspect. All right, so we wake Bugsy up, and I said, um, "Sir John, this man wants to know about suppression orders," and he said. Ah, the first one was 1828. It was an, an annulment of marriage on the grounds of impotence. And within and those old guys, they knew the law off by heart. You couldn't do it now. There's just too much of it. But do you remember the case? I don't remember the case. I mean, not the name, but the facts. I remember the fact that it was impotence in marriage. That there were two competing claims. So there was some very wealthy English landed gentry of some kind. <laughs> And they wanted an annulment of marriage and she was claiming it on the grounds of impotence and he was claiming it on the grounds of infidelity. Ah, yes. And they each sought to suppress the other one's claim about them. That's right. And the court held that you couldn't have the benefit of a suppression order that had no other particular relevance other than yeah. just to avoid people so within, being embarrassed. Within minutes, John Fain had his story well, took, took off back to the studio and Sir John got up wobbly and picked up his hat and he said to me, tell me, my girl, he always called me my girl, tell me, my girl, who was that, who was that gentleman with a green elephant in his ear? <laughs> so I went off and what it, what it meant was that when I researched, wrote and then performed my three-minute piece for audition to get, just to get an interview with Radio National, it meant that I could start off with the facts of this salacious tale, <laughs> then get into all the dry as dust stuff about suppression orders and how they're, instead of being a, a thing of great rarity, have become incredibly common, and how they're being abused, in fact, in various cases in different jurisdictions, and then finish off with, and what happened in the case. Mm. And at least that got me out of the hundreds and hundreds of people who applied for the job, at least it got me an interview and... Then from there on, it was up to me. So, and I like to think that Sir John and I had a little bit to do a with lot. The, the launching of your illustrious <laughs> career. Leave, leave that out. But it was a good <laughs> was a good example of how vital a good librarian is, because a librarian oh, yeah. is not just knowing where to find a book, but as you said, a resource. And I mean, that's a classic example of, you know, I was asking you about your transformation, your personal journey. It's an example of how you always saw the role as far more than just, you know lending books across a counter and making sure they came back on time. Well, a lot of things were changing then, technology for a start. We had the first online searching services coming in and I, I relished learning all of that. But back then, the law librarians in Melbourne and in Victoria were a very close-knit group of people and we shared resources, we shared ideas, we referred people on and I just loved all that people work. It was more about that than the books probably. We're on a bit of a diversion here, but let's keep going. Why, why did you change courses? What happened? Because somebody said to me they need a tribunal member at the SSAT and you've, you've got to apply. And I said, no, 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 I'm just a librarian. They wouldn't want me, you know, a working class girl, holes in my shoes, whatever. No, 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 I, I, I couldn't go on the tribunal. But they pushed and pushed and in the end I thought, well, if they've got that much faith in me, I, I might as well give it a go, and much to my total shock, a, a letter arrived from Brian Howe appointing me to the tribunal. This is in the Hawke government and he was the Minister for Social Security. That's yep. right, yep. Um, and then I, I think throughout my whole career it's been other people who've come and tapped me on the shoulder. I never set out to be the Health Services Commissioner. Which came later. Which came much later. Um, 
that I once I got used to the tribunal work, I just loved it. First time I sat behind that table, I knew not a thing. I hadn't read the Social Security Act, but that didn't matter because you couldn't read it. It was about that thick. Oh, hopeless. Mm. And but once I sat behind the desk in the role, all the other people in the room believed in me, and I was so grateful to them. Um, and, and it really was just about talking to people, hearing their side of the story. And Do I remember an anecdote from you? You once applied to be the librarian at the Library of the Supreme Court of Victoria when the vacancy I came up did, too. I did, yes. What happened? I didn't get it, thank God. <laughs> I'd be still there creaking around with George. George Alcorn that, uh, was the librarian um, that I worked most closely with and it was a very quirky, strange place, apart from those great big ladders that you have to climb to get the books down. Way, way up, oh. layer after layer after layer up under the dome of the Supreme Court that, courtyard, yes. Yeah, that's right. I do remember you telling me, though, that you applied for the job of Supreme Court librarian and you were told, oh, we're not sure who the next chap will be, but we don't know that it might be someone like you. I'd forgotten all about that, John. Yeah, that's exactly what they said. Yeah, and they said, um, you're a bit of an activist. Um, you could get very frustrated that the rate of change would be very slow here. So what would you do? And I said, well, I'd keep trying if I thought change was required. And I think that's when my application went down the gurgler. But they're a very conservative bunch, the judiciary. I remember um, former, now retired Supreme Court judge, Howard Nathan, who was a leading barrister but a very colourful and lively, charismatic character when he was made a judge, he was at a lunch and I was at and he said, oh, it's extraordinary, they're all so conservative. They, they come into the room, they sit in order of seniority, they <laughs> speak in order of seniority, they even take a piss in order of seniority. <laughs> that much I didn't know. But, <laughs> but I do know that um, when Mary Gordon was first... Uh, she was the first woman to be appointed to the High Court of Australia. Um, us feminist lawyers wrote her a letter saying that we sincerely hoped that there would be some female toilets available for her because the lack of female toilets had been an excuse for not allowing women into office for, for years. And, in fact, it was Sir John Norris's wife, Dame Ada, who, who wrote something saying, what a lot of nonsense. Men and women have been sharing toilets on aircraft for years. Anyway, Mary Gordon wrote back to us, um, assuring us, thanking us very much for um, congratulating her and, and assuring us that there were female toilets available. And I, sh I still have that letter. And now we have a female Chief Justice. There we you go. do indeed. Just in your working life. Um, uh, we will get back to the book in just a moment, but um, th there's such a rich vein here to explore uh, and I don't want to pass up the opportunity because we don't get them terribly often. Um, but the entire legal profession has gone through this extraordinary transformation in your time of being on its periphery and sometimes, in fact, at its core. Tell us about uh, something you were responsible for called Sit Down Girly, which <laughs> became a regular column in a national legal journal called first the Legal Service Bulletin and then later the Alternative Law Journal. And it's still in, it, I'm still writing it. So what happened was I walked down Burke Street one early morning and I met Renata Alexander who was working at Legal Aid at the time and she was looking very unhappy. She was wearing a dreadful wig or actually she was dragging along in her hand because if you got up late at Legal Aid you got the worst wig. This is a, not a personal wig, you're talking about a court wig. wig. Yeah, and they, they had shared wigs at mm -hmm. Legal Aid and mm -hmm. whoever got there first got the best wig. She was late that day. She got the worst wig. But she'd been in the Family Court of Australia and... Um, Back in the days when they did use wigs. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And she stood up at the wrong time. She thought the male barrister had finished. And the judicial registrar shouted at her, sit down, girly. And I thought, yes, that's the title I've been looking for. For what? For my column. Which was? Which was sit down, girly, for the old... Well, Legal Service Bulletin first. And what was its, uh, what was its purpose? It, it was a, um, a column that looked at law from a feminist perspective. It was quite kind to some men. At that time, the age had a little column called Pigpen, 
in which they wrote dreadful things that men had done to women. I actually had girlies man of the month because I figured you get more out of people if you encourage them than you do if you bag them. And so I remember one particular story. There was a woman who used to report in on parole every day to the Fitzroy Police Station. She believed she was on parole. She never was on parole, but she reported in dutifully and um, she was a real character around the town. I think I know who you're talking about, my former client. Possibly. Anyway, when she died, the police officers carried, they were, they were her pallbearers and carried her coffin. So I featured that as Gurley's um, Men of the Month and I got a letter from the sergeant there saying, thank you very much. Our boys are very proud of that and we have put it on the notice board. <laughs> so that was, it was humorous but it was serious as well. It was picking up on some of the peccadilloes, some of the put-downs, some of the more subtle forms of discrimination, which back then were, until you started remarking on them, they were unremarked upon. Um, I'm sure there were other people remarking on them too. But, but not, very, not out loud. Oh, well, I did. <laughs> no, but privately people did. Yeah. But you were putting it on paper in a national legal journal, even though it was a bit of a ratbag journal. Um, it was not a ratbag journal. I was its editorial assistant well, and I absolutely vouch then. for the fact that it was a ratbag journal. <laughs> yes, but then we came along. <laughs> <laughs> you made it respectable. Damn. But it was never it, respectable. I'll to, agree with you there. And you made mainstream what until then was regarded as uh, of passing interest only to a few people and you mainstreamed it. Well, well, that's kind of interesting because paralleling with that was my rise into more responsible positions and I think it was Sp Spencer Zifchak who whispered to me. Now Professor of Law at the Australian Catholic University. Yes, yeah. and he whispered to me that I couldn't do the column and be the president of the Mental Health um, Review Board as it was then. Um, so I handed it over to a colleague but it... it People went on with their careers and I kept getting called back to do another column and so we did it with um, pseudonyms. I don't like anonymous writing but it became part of the fun. So you'd have characters like oh, Law and Order, um, Lou Pole, things like that. Silly but people loved it. Hmm. And I got into terrible trouble from one of my absolute heroes, Michael Kirby, but he wrote to me very cross because I referred to him as Mr Justice Kirby. And you were not allowed to say Mr or Mrs or Ms. You had to say Justice. He'd rather you called him Michael, I think. Um, no, he's actually quite... Um, he, on formal occasions he's formal, but yeah. he's, he's also very relaxed about protocol yeah. in my experience. But we, we invited a him... A mercurial man. Oh, he's gorgeous. We invited him to speak at the um, pharmacy college one year and it was absolutely packed out because he was going to come out and say publicly that he was gay. So the, the word had spread. The big hall was packed out. He arrived. I was at the front door to meet him and he put his hand. I said to him, look, this gentleman here wants to know, Justice Kirby, do you want the full floodlights? He put his hand on my shoulder gently and said, Beth, why ever not? <laughs> yes, there's a few people. He is an extraordinary contributor on so many levels. Oh, yeah. Uh, but never shy of a microphone. And he loves the camera as well. Yep. yep, yep. We've drifted a bit. Let's go back because all of this is actually part of you. You've drawn on all of this back to Lost Lovelies Foundation because there's also a strong element. You, you touched on a moment ago on the Mental Health Tribunal. There's a strong element of what you learned in that role as well, psychiatry and the inability to understand whether someone's mad or bad. Yeah. Uh, and the fine line between those two is also a theme for some part of the story you tell in Lost Lovelies Foundation. So tell us about that part, both of the book and also your own experience. Okay. Well, um, when I came to the Mental Health Review Board, I knew very, very little about mental illness and mental health for that matter. Um, and so there were people I leaned quite heavily on learn from people like Jack Evans who was a psychiatrist because there were a lot of important reforms coming about at that time. Which is about when? We, uh, so when did I start there? 92? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so Jack Evans gave me good advice. I, I got this big heavy policy document that I had to respond to within 24 hours 
and I didn't know what to do. I took it to Jack and he did something incredibly valuable. He said, don't worry about that, that, that. You can concede that and that, but this is really important and so is this. This is what we have to fight for. So I could at least focus on the really important parts. Of, of the evolution of a whole new framework of... Or mental health services, men, mental health And transforming Act. the law about who could be locked up, how long yeah. they could be locked up for, under what circumstances, what checks and balances, yeah. appeal rights that had never existed before. Yeah. And, and, and the, the need always for independent review, mm -hmm. which... Because um, the psychiatrists were pretty much, they were God until then, weren't they? Absolutely. And... Um, and they opposed it like mad. Well, most people do when their power is being taken or diminished. Yep. Yeah, and to his credit, Paul Nassell, who you'll know as a doctor. Former head of the G AMA, AMA and while, GPs yep. Association. Yep, Society yep. of GPs, yep. yep. Well, uh, he began by opposing the Health Services Commission. He didn't see why doctors should have a formal body that they could be complained about to. And the Health Services Commission, which you were that commissioner, that, that's yep. like the ombudsman for complaints for, yep. about so, doctors. So by yep. the time I was appointed Health Services Commissioner, Paul was on the council and an absolute champion of the complaints process. So he completely evolved in his view and I've always had enormous respect for people who can do that, who can recognise that they were wrong and, and turn from an opponent to a supporter. But I think a lot of it, and I'm not necessarily, I don't know what Paul's journey was there, although I have great regard for him, but a lot of people in that situation say, well, this is going to happen. We can continue to try and stop it and fail, or we can try and influence how it happens yeah. by getting on board with the principle, but trying to finesse the detail. Yeah. And, and I always valued the advice that I got from my counsel. Um, I'm not a clinician. I've worked in health law nearly all my career. But when I need advice on clinical issues, I'll go to a clinician and ask them. And this brings up one of my favourite sayings, 75% of something is better than 100% of nothing. Absolutely. And if you're trying to stop a reform and you're on the losing side, you're getting 100% of nothing. That's right. So you may as well get on board and yep. say, well, this is going to happen. Let's see if we can influence how it's going to happen to make it better from yeah. our point of view. And, and, and from the point of view of complaints, there are always two sides to a story. Mm -hmm. And I was actually once asked to apply for the role of Human Rights Commissioner. and I, I State or federal? Federal. And I spent one of those weekends where you agonise over, do I want to do this? Am I capable of doing this? Um, and I concluded that because my whole career has been spent listening to both sides of a story, that I would make a lousy advocate. So I didn't apply for that reason. Human Rights Commissioner needs to be out there advocating for change, sticking up for people's rights. We do that to a certain extent on the tribunals, but we hear from all parties. And it's quite remarkable how the story changes when you hear all sides of the story. Back to Lois Lovely's foundation and drawing on all this experience and all this knowledge and all the, the contacts and the cases and the appeals and the like, there's a, there's a threat of compassion for people who suffer from mental illness as you tell us the story, not just of Martha, who starts to see that, that victims are offenders and offenders are victims. And, you know, it's a, the tabloid media love portraying, you know, victims are good, offenders are bad. Yeah. But so often in the real world, if anyone's ever worked in the criminal courts or the mental health system or any of these areas, you know that they're one and the same. Yeah. Today's victim is tomorrow's offender and today's offender is tomorrow's victim. And at any point in their lives, you're not sure which one this person actually is or yeah. which to try and turn them into kind of cardboard cutouts is absurd, but that's what the media does. We'll come to the media in a moment. But you, you've, you've got this process of humanising the woman who stole the baby in the first instance, um, how hard is it to recast someone from villain to then having some sympathy for them as a, themselves a victim of a system? I didn't find that difficult at all um, and I hope that my readers won't. Um, and, and, and that's what I wanted to do with the book, not just do that stereotyping 
one side good, one side bad, because human beings are far more complex than that. So I didn't find Jennifer. Some, some, some are, yeah. I, I won't pursue that. <laughs> <laughs> I might think of who you mean. Um, but Jennifer um, is a complex character in a difficult situation and votes are not won by um, protecting prisoners' rights. Mm. Um, no uh, votes in prisons is one of the oldest sayings in politics. Yeah, yeah. And, and politicians probably come off worse than anyone in the book. Oh, I think the journalists come out pretty badly. We'll come oh, to that you? next. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you've met, you've worked with politicians, good and bad, surely there. I've worked with some fantastic politicians from all sides. Hmm. In fact, once there was an article in The Age saying mental health, tribe, the mental health review board's hopeless, parents work really hard to get um, care for their mentally ill children, then along comes the review board and they just believe them, everything they say. So I rang up the Honourable John McGrath and said, and he said, oh, oh, gee, love, you're not angry at me, are you? And I said, no, no, I just want to talk to you. So he said, I'll come, I'll come and see you. I said, no, no, I'll come up to Parliament House. So I went up. And who was he for people? John McGrath was the member for Warrnambool. Mm -hmm. um, he had children with mental illness. And How long he, ago? Um, would be between 1992 and 1997. Mm -hmm. um, and... So I went to see him up at Parliament House and I said, look, we sit there behind the bench like three wise monkeys, okay? The patient is saying, I will always take my medication. Yes, I understand that I've got a mental illness and I need it. And the parent's sitting there looking mortified because it has been very difficult for them to get care mm. for their, their loved one. And I say to John, we're not going to go nudge, nudge, wink, wink to you. You just have to understand that we are tra well-trained people who know what we're doing and we must look impartial. And he, he got it all. He, he walked me to the door of Parliament House and we stood up on the steps and he waved down Burke Street. He said, down here, he said, they've got us in this house bashing each other's heads in, arguing and taking sides. He said, the most important and valuable work that's ever been done in this place is through the committees, mm. which are made up of all parties. He said, snappy jo Tom Roper, he, he, he has given me more help than anyone on the issue. He was the health minister in the Kane government. And he Labor. Yep. yep. Yeah. And, and McGrath was national. So opposite sides of the political spectrum working together really, really well um, to make the rights of mentally ill people um, more real. But still sticking to the psychiatry side of things, yep. um, the communities understanding of these issues, it's a bit like I was saying before, victim offender, um, there are mental health issues people are enormously sympathetic to. In particular now, we have a different attitude to suicide, we have a different attitude to what used to be called a mental breakdown, we believe in mental self-care, mental health self-care and all of that much more than we ever used to and talk about it. But as soon as there's an element of crime, it's as if the curtain comes down. Yes. Yes, and we've, we've seen a spate of... Um murders recently um, where the person has a mental health issue um, and I'm, I'm just being a bit careful here. I don't want to um, cause any subdue to say, but um, I'm thinking of the lady who drove the car into the lake at Wendery mm -hmm. with the children in it. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at that, just in the facts, hideous crime mm -hmm. and she's serving a lot of time in jail recently been slightly reduced. She, the gender lens, the mental health lens, was never really properly focused on that case. She had a shocking um, background, very traumatised. Um, I, I think a great injustice was done there. And on the sentencing or the conviction? In the, in the sentencing. Only on the sentencing? Yes, I think. Um, maybe on the conviction as well. Because you had Farquharson, which was the previous case yes. of a man who drove into a lake yes. with his children in the car. So you had a clear point of reference for the sentencing. Very, very different motivations for the crime, however. Mm -hmm. And if you read Helen Garner's excellent book, This House of Grief, the character that she paints, Farquharson, was not driven by um, trauma, but by self 
aggrandizement, I think. That's revenge. probably not a good picture of it. And revenge, but that's just revenge. that's just Helen's version of it. The court, of course, didn't – well, she was observing the court. The court passed sentence on the facts that were presented to the court. Yep. She then interpreted them in a, in a, in a book, which and, is – And she's a person whose interpretations I personally really respect. Mm. Okay. Um, I mentioned before, as we go back to Lost Lovely's Foundation, that I thought that the journalists, maybe it's because I identified with some <laughs> of the work that they do, they came out of it particularly poorly. There are – two main characters representing the media, so to speak. As your Lost Lovelies Foundation goes through a, a sort of cascading series of, of mistakes and errors and we've touched on the fact that things start to implode a little bit, um, we also are introduced to a few characters who are working in the media and you've had a lot to do with the media over the time. Yes. I'm just wondering who you've modelled your good and bad journalist on as they go through... Okay. I, have, I haven't modelled anybody who we, on who any... Who we want to defame and okay. uh, who, who we want to pick fights with here in order to completely ruin our prospects of ever being able to walk down William Street unmolested again. <laughs> okay. I've been very careful not to write about <laughs> real people, John. I've noticed. And although I will say that the older journalist, Jack, is stereotyped. Yes. He wears the trench coat. He drinks too much. But he's a really good journalist. With a big heart. And I said to my husband, what do you think of this character? He said, I just love him. I said, he's too stereotyped. I've got to change him. But Dave loved him so much that I actually left him in there. I got to like him too, even though he's quite disgusting. Well, he's, he's old school, isn't he? He's very old school. And I've worked with exactly um, journalists like that. Oh, Julian Gardner's still got one. Trench coats. Julian's worn a trench coat for years. I told him he looked like a flasher. But he's, he's not a journalist, we should quickly point out. He's no, he's not a highly journalist. highly regarded former member of, of tribunals, director of legal aid, uh, all sorts of wonderful things, and personally the architect also of the voluntary assisted dying laws that have be in, recently been in, adopted yeah, in Victoria. He was my boss at the Work Care Appeals Board. Yeah, wonderful And he's man. the person who was responsible for me stepping up from being one of the crew to being a manager and a leader. And that came about by accident because um, he came to me one day and said, oh, I hear you would rather have an office with a window. I said, no, 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 I'm fine here because I was at the back of the building and I could sneak off. <laughs> and he said, no, look, there's an office come up and it's got a window. It's really good. And I said, no, no, I'm perfectly – look, you'd be doing me a favour, Julian said. I said, oh, all right, I'll move to the office with the window. Where is it? Oh, he said, that's the problem. It's next to me. And so that because I had to be next to Julian, I started to see the world from a manager's point of view rather than just one of the crew. And, and I found it really intriguing. And I think he deliberately did that. Oh, I'm sure he would have. Because he decided that I had some kind of management material, I guess. So I do owe a lot to dear Julian. Yes. What was the view like out the window? Wasn't much of a view. <laughs> <laughs> and I was too busy listening to what was going on in Julian's office. <laughs> so back to the other journalist named Jack. Um, not No, he's Jamie. Sorry, one? Jamie. Yeah. Jamie. Uh, the not not of the same old school inclination. No, he's younger and he's randier. Um, what, and he, what do you mean randier? Sexier. He likes sex. Yes, but... Um, how much do we want to spoil things here? But he also, he gets... He's, what on he, the, he's on the make. Yes, he is. But what he does absolutely wrong, as his older colleague points out, he actually gets so enthralled by this woman that he becomes more like her publicist than, than, than someone who's writing an expose. He abandons his journalistic independence and along with it, of course, any pretense of integrity. That's right. He's having an affair with her while writing stories about the foundation and yep. its work and yep. the political tussles to bring in these laws about mental health. Yeah. Have you seen examples of people um, abandoning their ethics and pretending they don't have a conflict of interest? All the time. Um, it's, it's a very common human trait. <laughs> it's a, we, we have a bit of an ethical crisis, not just in the media. Across the board, we have a, you know, you can see the Royal Commission into Banking, you can see the aged care crisis. I mean, you could keep on going for ages. Um, you know, we, 
we're sitting talking to each other the morning after Four Corners oh. built a story built on the bonk ban, which exposed the fact that two senior ministers in the then Turnbull government, but still ministers in the Morrison government, were having affairs, extramarital affairs, consensual, but with staffers in defiance of the bonk ban, and Malcolm Turnbull has joined in the pylon in, in outing them. Um, so, I mean, we have an ethical crisis on so many different levels, so many layers in the business community, the political community, but also in the media community. And yet yeah. the media is so quick to point it out in other people. Um, very, very, they get very indignant if the blowtorch is ever turned around and applied to them. Yes. Um, yeah, hardly a day goes by that there's not another um, crime, um, theft exposed in the paper. And most of them are not particularly interesting. They're just greedy. You know, from a psychiatric point of view, you want some kind of interesting pathology going on, but it's just just greed. They just want money and they get away with it. They're not pop properly scrutinised. And, um, gosh, I can't. there's hardly any department where it hasn't arisen. Well, we've seen recent scandals now in, in the transport cleaning contracts. Oh. Yet another one, $33 million for a plot of land that's worth $3 million for Sydney's Western Airport. On and on it goes. We could keep on rolling. You'd, you'd like to think that these things are being uncovered because there's more scrutiny and it's harder for people to get away with that kind of thing. But thank you, Donald Rumsfeld. There's known knowns, there's known unknowns and there's unknown unknowns. <laughs> we don't know what we don't know. We don't. We and don't. if people don't go looking, they don't find. That's but right. Back to Lost Lovely's Foundation, the media are inevitably part of the manipulation that charities engage in in order to grow their influence and their power, and your character does exactly that as well. Yes, and, and they're really important to get the message out. Um, my publisher, um, Regina Lane from Laneway Press, she, th she thought that um, Anita might have been a little bit over the top, the way that I'd portrayed her, but I sent her a newspaper article picturing someone from a charity standing in extraordinary clothing in, in, beside an extraordinary car and she said, well, Beth, after you sent me that, Anita's quite mild really. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many dimensions and we've touched on the main themes, I hope, in going through Lost Lovely's foundation. Um, just before we finish, and we're, we're pretty much out of time, You've been a librarian, you've been a tribunal president and you've been a manager and you've been a complaints commissioner and so many other different roles. How did you adapt to being a writer? Uh, I was helped by a broken foot how and that, how COVID. That, sorry, how did that help? <laughs> well, because I couldn't move, so I had to write. <laughs> you, I, was, I was grounded. So yes. I, had, I had surgery on my foot and literally for the first couple of weeks I wasn't allowed to move at all. Um, and, and I was lame for quite a long time. I'd been writing on and off for amusement for quite a while, and you might have recognised Cape Bridgewater in the early chapter, John, because I know that you've been there. Which is uh, where you've hung out for many, many years. Oh yeah, it's a place I really love. Um, so th that second chapter was actually written years and years ago at Cape Bridgewater, but I'd set that all aside and then when I started writing this book, I salvaged some of the material from the original book. And then about 35 years ago, I was on holidays down in the southwest and David Marr came on the radio on The Arts Today and he invited listeners to write their life story on an A4 sheet of paper. So every day I wrote a little bit and thought about it. I only had the dogs with me and a few tiger snakes for company and I wrote and wrote and wrote and sent it off. And lo and behold, David Marr's program chose my little story to be their swan song. And at the end of that little story, which was read out beautifully by an actress, um, it says, David Marr wants us to write our life story on an A4 page. Foolish man, my life is my memories. There are far too many for that. Let him wait for the novel. Well, David Marr, <laughs> 35 years later, here's the novel, The Lost Lovelies Foundation. And congratulations and thank you very much for telling what I know to be only a small sample of your stories. Thank you, On John. our chat today. 
Thank you, Beth, and congratulations. The Lost Lovelies Foundation by Beth Wilson.